Okay, so today we're going to try to go through some of the aspects of the math spec um, and talking about some of the different components of them and how they work. I don't have the best video set up for this, um, so it could get kind of messy, but we're just going to go with it. Um, so behind me right now, I have the Q objective. So we have the math spec here and we have the LC. Some other components of the instrument that we have um, that help operate this instrument. Um, over here we have this is our nitrogen generator. And so the way that we um, hook nitrogen up to this instrument for the gases and for the vacuum um, and fragmentation in the HTD Collision Center have um, well, rely on um, nitrogen. And so we use house air that's pumped in through the building and this peak nitrogen generator um, that converts it into nitrogen and then it's hooked up to the instrument. The output pressure on this is the only thing that you need to check. Um, the instrument recommends, I think that it's supposed to be somewhere around, I think 100 um, PSI. Ours at the highest is around 90, but that seems to be sufficient. So anything that's above 80 has been working um, for our purposes. So that's always something that you want to check and make sure that there's um, gas going to the instrument. If not, you're not going to be able to run it. Um, and when they shut the house air off, you're going to have to put the instrument into its off state um, and then bake it out when it comes back on. And this has happened a couple of times. This little setup we have right here um, is our backup storage. So all of the data that is collected onto our computer, so this is the cube computer that operates the instrument, is stored on this NAS, um, and then we can access it remotely. Um, so it's backup for all of the data. Down here, you can see that there's this large um, power pack. So this is our backup battery source. This, if there's temporary fluctuations in um, the power, this will keep the instrument on for a few minutes. Um, but I've been told that it can't keep it for really extended periods of time. So um, this kind of just helps. It's like a surge protector battery pack. Um, and then if we walk around to the back side of the instrument, there's one other um, component, which is right here on the floor, um, which is the four pump. And the four pump is a separate unit. It needs to have maintenance. Um, done to it yearly, which is mostly just an oil change and occasionally the filters change. Um, but if that is not working, again, your meth spec will not work. So um, in terms of just general things about the MS, I'm going to try to roll this so that it doesn't get um, too messy. So you can see right here, we have our status bar. And there's a series of different lights. So you have a green light telling you that the power is on. This one tells you that the vacuum is on. This is the status of the instrument, meaning that it's ready to run. So basically you have the green light to go. Currently our system light, it's hard to see here is orange because I have the system in standby. If I turned the instrument on, this would turn to green. And if things were being injected into the instrument, you would see a blue bar coming here telling you that it's scanning. Okay, so this is kind of one way for you to see um, how the instrument is working. There are a series of switches down here. <laughs> Again, like I said, not a great video. Um, so you have the general power switch um, and you have a electronic switch. So this instrument has the capacity to turn the electronics on and off without actually turning off the instrument. And so sometimes there'll be glitches and you can just flip that off and sometimes that'll fix it. Um, kind of like any sort of technology, right? Um, if you are doing maintenance and you need to break vacuum, you turn off the electronics, then you turn off the maintenance switch, take these covers off and pull the instrument apart. Um, and then when you put them back on, basically do it in the opposite order. So the electronics need to come back on last. If you shut the electronics off for any appreciable amount of time, um, the computer will tell you that they've been shut off and it needs, I want to say somewhere around 80 minutes to re-equilibrate. For the mass spec right now, um, we have the HESI, so this is the heated electro ionization spray um, source that's hooked up to it. 
And then you can see up here, we have our syringe pump. And so if I were to kind of take these apart, I can show you a little bit. So this is the ion source if we're doing um, higher flow rates. So when we're calibrating the instrument or if we're doing direct infusion, um, this is the source that you'll need to use. You can see on it that the needle or the probe is rather large. Um, and there's various different, it's kind of hard to see, um, little spigots in there where you're having gas being injected in, which helps to set up the flow rate. Right here, we have um, the spray cone. And this little tube right here that goes inside where the sample actually gets injected is called the ion transfer tube. The ion transfer tube gets dirty um, and occasionally needs to be cleaned. It's this long pin that sits inside the instrument, so this is our extra one. Um, and so oftentimes about once a week um, when you're calibrating the instrument, it's also a good idea to take this out and clean it. And you clean it using a methanol um, water bath and sonicate it for five minutes. So I'll post another video showing general maintenance. Um, but that's kind of the general setup. The other source that we have, which we use for proteomics, is our NanoFlex source. And our NanoFlex source um, looks a little different. So if, let's hook this up. So to put these on, there are little um, flappy wings. So you want to make sure that um, those bars are aligned. You kind of have to give it some force to put it on. When you take the source off or on, the instrument will automatically tell you that it's put itself into standby and that if you don't put it back on within an hour, that it's going to shut the instrument off. And this is because you're opening the source. Basically, you have really high electrical current that's going in here. Um, and you want to keep the system closed. You can pull this um, little tray out. And it's going to be kind of hard to see. But this piece right here is where we actually put our column. Um, the needle sticks in this part. I don't have it hooked up right now because we're not running any samples. Um, and you can adjust the position of this so that you have the appropriate angle spraying into the instrument. You can adjust um, the horizontal angle up and down and the forward and back using these various knobs. And then this can manually be adjusted to change the angle. Um, this nano source has the additional capacity to have a camera hooked up to it. Um, and so you can see up above me, I can look at the position. So this is my um, ion transfer tube, the tip of it where I'm spraying into the instrument. Um, and you can look at the alignment of your um, needle in relation to that. So um, that's just kind of a quick overview of the different sources that we have. Up here, like I said, this is our um, syringe pump. And our syringe pump, for the most part, we use when we are calibrating. Um, As I mentioned before, we have a Hamilton syringe, it's 500 microliter syringe um, that we got with the instrument. And basically, we load sample into this. Um, typically, it's Calmix. And then hook it up through these peak fittings, put it into the syringe pump. There's another peak fitting that connects into here. So we put the syringe online. You can either manually control it here, so I can turn the syringe on, which will start pushing sample through at whatever rate I've specified, or you can also control that through tune. So most of what I'm going to be talking about today is the LC component. And 
I don't know how well um, you're going to be able to see things, but we have various different components of the LC. So up top, we have our um, rack holder, and this is where all of our solvent bottles are. So we have our loading buffer, solvent A, solvent B, and our rear seal wash fluid. Okay, so these are all solutions that I've talked about in previous um, videos. Some of these are hooked up to the degasser, so this top portion. Um, you can see that there's various, various lines that are coming in and going out. That helps to eliminate any bubbles that are in the line. Um, and then others just go straight into um, the pump module. So the pump module is here. This is our column chamber. And this is where we have our auto sampler and the samples sit down in this bottom portion. So to kind of talk you through, um, let's try to get this a little bit closer, some of the components. So um, the auto gasser should always be on and always set up. So this is something that you shouldn't have to worry about. In terms of our pumps, on this output screen, um, this is where you'll have information on the pump. So it tells you about the NC pump. It tells you about the loading pump. So right now my NC pump, the flow is on. The loading pump, the flow is off. The flow rate for the NC pump is 0.3 microliters per minute. The flow rate for the loading pump would be five microliters per minute. I can see what my pressure is. So it's stabilized at 316 bar. My loading pump doesn't have any pressure because um, it's not on. And then I can also see the percentage of each tube that I have coming in. So I have solvent A at 96%, solvent B at 4%, and then as I mentioned before, for my loading buffer, I have all three lines, A, B, and C. So you can kind of see they have these little, oops, I'm gonna start knocking stuff over, um, tags on it telling you which line it is. So this one's A, this one's B. I know you probably can't see that from there. Um, and like I said, I just have this running at 100% um, A. Down here, this is our column oven. And so again, this is gonna tell you what the compartment temperature is set at which currently it's set at 35 degrees Celsius, and our switching valve is in that one-two position. And then finally down here, we have information about the auto sampler. So you have um, the sample position. So the last file that I sampled was in GA3, which means green, A, first row, three, um, third column. The sample's being held at four degrees Celsius. My injection volume was one microliter, and the, it's in the load position um, instead of in the inject position. Down here, let's try to put this on a stable surface, um, is where we have our auto sampler. And so if you flip this up, you can see that there's various different components of the auto sampler. So we have our sample rack in here. Um, again, it's not very easy to see, but you have these trays with one comes around. Um, actually, let me rotate. Okay, so you can see that there are these vials. Um, these have our loading buffer in it, and you can see that I kind of have that scribbled on here. Um, these um, vials have different positions. So if you could see in here, there's five different holes. Um, each one has a number on it, and then it's associated with the color of the tray that's in the back. Um, and so this one is in position R1. And when we're setting up our methods, we tell the instrument that that vial is there so that it can pick up sample and load it onto the column. In terms of our trays, they come in these little racks that look like this. And so these can hold um, 40 different vials. You can see that our rows are labeled A through E. Um, the columns are labeled one through eight. And then back here um, on the little, um, it is the different color so this one says R and so when I'm setting my position for the sample to get picked up if I tell it RA1 it will pick up this file if I tell it RC8 it will pick up this file right so it's just a way of telling the needle where to put our sample these are the fluidics um, and so this is also filled with buffer 
If you see an air bubble in here, you need to get the air bubble out. Um, I've never had to do that. So you're probably going to have to call a service technician, but you could basically take this apart. Um, this little fun thing is our wand. And our wand controls this. So you can have manual control over um, the auto sampler or any of these different components using this. It's way easier to use it um, or operate from the computer. So really the only time I ever use this is if I'm clearing an error message that comes from the rear seal wash fluid needing to be um, replaced. So that error message we talked about. So in terms of our auto sampler, we have multiple different components down here. So this right here is where our actual needle is. And you can't see it right now because, well, maybe you can see right here. It's a very, very, very thin um, tube. So I'm trying to see if I have anything that's like equivalent size to it. Um, like it's smaller in diameter than this, right? So it's very, very tiny, very delicate. And so we need to be careful about protecting it. And so when we're in our settings and um, going through the puncture depth, again, it's gonna tell it how far down is your sample in these little teeny vials. So these are our sample vials. Um, so the needle doesn't jam itself into the bottom and damage itself. There are two different positions that this can be in. This is the load position. Um, and this is like a little waste receptacle. And so let's see if we can change it to inject. Start over here. Um, Now that's just changing the valves. Um, well, let's try it this way. Okay, so you can see that I just changed the position. Um, so this is going into my loading buffer. And what's gonna happen is it's gonna inject one microliter of water, because that's what I have in GA3, with 19 microliters of this sample buffer into the instrument. And so this is all automatically controlled. The way that this works, it's kind of hard to see from here, but you have a six port valve that's sitting right here. This is picking up sample from our loading buffer and loading it into this tube. It's then going to go into, this is our column loop. And the column loops look something like this, right? So there's various different sizes. This one is a 20 microliter loop. Um, we also have one microliter loops. The one that's on there right now, um, I believe is also a 20 microliter loop. Okay, so that means the 20 microliters fits in that. We have a line, this one, um, that is going, let's double check that it's going the right way, um, up into our column, which we'll talk about. And then we have another one that's bringing loading buffer down um, from our loading pump. And so I'm gonna stop this injection because we're not actually doing anything. Um, and then show you if it ever stops. Um, if we wash our needle in fluidics, which is gonna pump solution, basically what we're doing is we're cleaning everything that's in that line out and making sure everything's primed so that when we put a sample in, we're only looking at our sample. Um, and it's possible that I just made the instrument really mad by having it inject something. Um, but if you look, the needle's actually still down in this tube. And once it's done picking it up, which it just did, it's gonna go over to the waste and eject everything out there. Okay, so this is our auto sampler. The next oven is probably the most important, well, second most important, but likely the most confusing. Um, and so what we have here is what's known as a 10 port valve. And I'm gonna go, I took a picture of this, which might make it a little bit easier. 
um, to look at. So this is our 10 port valve. And so what that means is you have this little um, setup where you can have these Viper fitting. Which look um, like this. That screw into the port. And depending on what position these different valves are in depends on how stuff flows through the instrument, okay? And so if we look at this, this is valve one, this is valve two, valve three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, okay? So there's 10 there. Um, this one right here is in 10. What we have going on here is, um, which is kind of hard to see, Oh, I don't have my video. Oh, wrong one up. Um, up here, we have a line, this one right here, that is coming from the nano pump. And so this is this line right here, which is going into position three, I believe, um, is going to be carrying loading um, buffer, or not loading buffer, our solvents A and B into the instrument. And that is going to flow directly into our column, which is in this one, and then go straight onto the mass spec. I don't have this hooked up right now, so it's kind of hard to see. We also have in here, in positions, um, where's our trap column? Two and five, so here and here. There's this little loop and you can see this. This is our um, trap column. And the trap column is a pre-column, um, which allows us to trap or basically like um, purify our sample a little bit more, especially because we're doing complex samples that maybe have a lot of containments in it before we inject it into the instrument. We also have um, a line coming in from the auto sampler, which is right here. And then this line right here in 10, which is going to the waste. These other two ports, this one is plugged, so there's nothing there. And these just create a loop to also close the system off. When the valve is in the one, two position, buffer comes down from the loading pump and basically things are flowing this way through that valve series, okay? So this comes from the loading pump, into three, it goes into four, flows into the column, goes into the mass spec. The one that's coming from the auto sampler is basically just gonna go straight to waste. And this trap column, nothing's flowing into it, okay? Because of the way things are positioned. If I switch these valves to the 10-1 arrangement, what happens is it switches the flow of everything. And so if we switch that arrangement, now we're going in this, direction. And so sample coming from the auto sampler up is going to go into our trap column. It's going to come down and meet with this valve that is bringing in our um, solvents A and B, so our liquid and mobile phase, and be injected onto the column. Okay. And so by controlling those valve positions, we can control um, what is moving in or out of the instrument at any given time. So, um, trying to get it to go back to full screen, but I don't know how to do that. So I can see what you guys are actually looking at. Oops. Okay, there we go. Um, so, trap column is right here. It's this huge metal. Um, this isn't actually the column. This is just the holder for it. You can see that all of our fittings have these Viper plugs, um, which is good because it helps to create a nice seal. This right here, which I'm going to try to be very gentle with it, is actually our column. And so the column that we're using for this is a really long column. So it's a 25 centimeter column, which needs to be heated. This is one of the nano connectors that's going to keep um, some of this capillary tubing connected to it. And then right now, I have this flowing into the waste. 
Um, and so this would be where my admitter would be attached onto my column and this would get sprayed into the instrument. But because I need to keep my loading clumps on and I don't want acetonitrile just evaporating into the air, um, we're pumping these very small, 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 small portions um, out to waste. So um, you can see that because I had the column of an open, I know it's kind of blurry, the temperature dropped to 33.6 and the status light turned orange. That just means that it will run, but it's not um, completely set the way that you wanted it to be. At the top here is where we have our valve settings. And so all of these lines are coming down and being plumbed into these different pumps. Over here is where we have our loading pump, and these are our two nano pumps. So we have our right block and our left block. Um, for the loading pump, if I were to follow, so these are my loading buffers. They're going to come into the degasser up here. And then this is going to leave the degasser and input um, solvent into these three ports, okay? So there's little connectors that say A, B, and C. Um, and then these, if you look closely, which is kind of hard to see because there's a lot of hardware in here, these are connected to this pump lock, okay? So this is the loading pump lock. This should be calibrated. You should never actually have to touch this part. Um, this over here has a little vial on it that you will unscrew if you are um, purging the valve. And so if I wanted to go through and purge, because this pump is off, it doesn't matter, I unscrew this. I would tell the instrument that I wanted to purge the loading pump. It would ask me to ensure that the valve is open and I would say, okay. And then it would start pumping air through to try to get any bubbles out of the system. These two are solvent A and solvent B. Um, and you can follow, again, the plumbing through this, but up here, again, I know you can't see this, it actually says A and B and where these inlets are coming for and which block they're connected to. So again, looking up at the top, this is my solvent A. This is going to come down here, hook up through this connector. So if I wanted to shut off the load of this pump lock, um, I could turn this valve. I don't want to do that though. Um, and then it's going to go in down here into our left block. There are tiny little Viper connectors that put it up into here. And then over here, we also have our purge valves. Same thing um, with solvent B. Where does solvent B go? This one. So it's connected here. This goes into the right pump block. We have our purge valve um, and your inlet. There's two other components of this. Um, let's go back over to the screen share and see if we can see this on um, one of the pictures a little bit better. Um, I can't find my share. Oh, there we go. Having a rough time here. Okay, so um, this one right here is B, it's your pump block. Inlet is here. You can see this is the purge B. Here's purge A. Right here, it says outlet viper only. And this outlet, um, it's kind of hard to see because it got cut off here, is the pro or the flow meter, okay? And so the flow meter is what's taking these two solvents, mixing them together at whatever rate they're supposed to be or proportion they're supposed to be mixed at, and it's sending it out through this flow meter, through this tube, down into this 10 port um, block, right? And so we're taking solvent from here down to there. If you purge these blocks, you need to open these valves all the way. For the loading pump, you only need to open it like a quarter of a turn um, to let sufficient pressure out. If you need to calibrate the pro flow meter, um, let me turn the flow off. What you would do is unscrew 
this fiber fitting, which I guess I don't need to do. Um, and then we have a tool somewhere in my little messy drawer. That you hook up to it. And this basically um, just allows the connection to drip fluid out as it's um, purging that pump in case you have any air bubbles in there. If you're ever doing those auto tests, it will tell you that you cannot have your column or anything plugged up. And so there's also plugs, the fiber plugs that look just like this, right? So it's a fiber plug, but there's nothing to come out of it that you'll instrument or that you'll put into that to actually block flow off. And then the back pressure building up helps to set the, the seals and pumps in these blocks. Right here is our rear seal wash fluid. Okay, and so this really thin flimsy line that's coming down is going to go into this little turret and this has a rear seal wash. The rear seal wash is responsible for keeping the pistons and the pump heads like working correctly. And like I said, this cycles once an hour. For some reason, it has errors associated with it that has nothing to do with the functionality. Um, but just to show you what happens if I go through and cycle it. So you can see that that little wheel starts spinning and it's pumping our real rear sea wash through the system. Because this line that's coming out of our methanol bottle is really flimsy, sometimes it does get bubbles in it. Um, and so it's necessary to just cycle that a couple of times. So one other thing that you need to be aware of is you can see that there's a lot of connections in here. It doesn't happen very often. Usually it's if you're switching things, but you can get leaks. Um, in these different fittings because over time they'll loosen. Um, everything should be finger tight is what they tell you with these Viper fittings. Um, but it's always a good idea before you run anything to make sure that there's no bubbles in your system. Make sure that nothing in here is leaking um, and that nothing in your, your other columns is leaking as well. If you do that, you should get um, pretty good flow going through your system and it should be pretty easy to set up um, a stable spray so that you get good um, chromatography when you're doing your MS. So um, that's how that works.